regret that I can't be there with you today because of family matters, but I am delighted that they're giving me this opportunity to still to be able to give my talks. The first talk I'm giving you here today is using secondary data in statistical analysis. There'll be two parts to this talk. During the first part, I will give you five simple steps to explain to you how to do a meta-analysis. Then in the second part of the talk, I'm a sepsis researcher. I will try to bring these different techniques and methods to life by showing you how I've used them in sepsis research. But let me begin. First, a definition of what is a meta-analysis. It was defined in 1976. It's the statistical analysis of a large collection of results from the individual literature for the purpose of integrating their respective findings. There's two basic purposes to a meta-analysis. One is to determine if similar treatment effects exist for a therapy in independent studies to estimate a net effect for this therapy in the setting that you think each one of the individual studies was underpowered. But I think the more interesting use of a meta-analysis, and I'll discuss in detail today, is if the treatment effects differ substantially for a therapy among independent studies, and that's to try to determine what may explain these differing effects. And I believe you learn mechanisms and understanding of disease processes by doing this type of a meta-analysis. But before I go on to show you the steps of a meta-analysis, my first question is, why do you think it took till 1976 for the definition of meta-analysis to take place? Well, the reason is, is that the randomized control trial the basic element of a meta-analysis wasn't invented until the late 1940s. And then it took from 1940s to 1976 to accumulate enough randomized controlled trials in any one subject or topic so that a meta-analysis was possible. The first step of doing a meta-analysis, and I'll be presenting you five easy steps, is formulating the question. This is a critically important factor. Validity and importance are contingent on this step. A poorly conceived research hypothesis will usually lead to an analysis of dubious value. Then what you have to do is remember that a meta-analysis is a prospective analysis. It's just the same as a randomized controlled trial. The only difference between a meta-analysis and a randomized controlled trial is when you do a meta-analysis, the patients have already been enrolled. But other than that, everything is prospective. You write down ahead of time what your conclusion criteria are and what kind of patients and what kind of trials you're going to be enrolling. It's systematic and explicit. And ideally, you're going to enroll in your study randomized trials with similar diagnosis, outcome, patient characteristics, and treatment groups. But I'm going to discuss this point a little bit further. Next, you want to define the eligibility criteria. And this is where I said I was going to define this a bit further. There are two ways you can do a meta-analysis. One is you can include all the available studies regardless of size, design, quality, an analysis that is broadly representative, but may compromise accuracy, but tells you the full extent of what the clinical experience is. Alternatively, you can do a meta-analysis that has this exclusion of poorly done studies, and this will increase the statistical validity, but limit the generalizability. My approach is that you include both, and you analyze them separately, and you use the two of these, one to determine the generalizability and the second one to determine the statistical validity, and then you use these two to come to overall conclusions. Step three is identifying the studies and data abstraction. This usually begins with getting a librarian or some person who is very familiar with large data sets, and you do searches based on keywords and you obtain all the studies which may be relevant to the question that you're asking. These usually result in large numbers of studies being obtained, so, and they often are in the thousands, and you peruse the titles and the abstracts 
to exclude studies which were included which are not relevant to what you're trying to analyze. Once you've come to the number of studies which are relevant, the full texts and the remaining articles retrieved are thoroughly reviewed in studies. Reference lists of these studies are gone through, and once a study is selected for inclusion, the data should be extracted by one or more reviewers from structured forms which have the data that you want to analyze. Step four is, you have to ahead of time determine what your common measure effect should be. You want this to be inclusive so that you will capture all your studies with this treatment effect. Then the question becomes, should you use what kind of model in order to put all the data together? A fixed effects or random effects? And this has a lot of controversy in the field of meta-analysis. A fixed effect says that you're using a source of variability which relates to the study itself. A random effect is a more large source of variability. It relates to the population in the studies. In actual fact, in different situations, each one of these is more likely to show significance. But if somebody has done a good meta-analysis, they should include both the p-values for the fixed effects and random effects, and they should be fairly similar. Lastly, step four in terms of the different techniques. The most important thing to look at when you see a meta-analysis is the Cochrane Q statistic and the I-squared. What this does is it tells you if the studies included have similar effects. Let me concentrate on the I-squared. The I-squared can vary from zero to 100%. If the I-squared is above 30%, it means that the studies shouldn't be combined. And then if you turn back to what I said in the very beginning, you should be looking for reasons that different studies had different effects. If the I-squared is below 20%, that means the studies have similar treatment effects and you combine them. To put this more to reality, you wouldn't want to combine apples and oranges. If some studies show a treatment effect is harmful and some studies show another the same treatment effect is beneficial, combining those in to show that there's no effect makes no sense. You'd want to determine why some studies showed harm and some studies shows benefit. One of the ways of analyzing studies which have heterogeneity, that is a high I-squared, is to do a meta-regression. And I'm going to explain to you in detail, because that term is very big and complicated, and make it very simple what a meta-regression is. And lastly, you want to do a examination if there's publication bias. That is, you want to determine if you have a random sample of studies. There wasn't something that caused people not to publish the studies, such as there were a lot of small studies and only the ones that were beneficial were published. You want to make sure that you have a random sample of studies, and I'm going to actually show you in subsequent slides what a funnel plot is and make it come to life. Lastly, step five is how you report your results, and they've developed rules for this. And to improve the overall quality, they've developed checklists and flowcharts based on something called the quorum statement, quality of reporting of meta-analysis. And it provides you in that statement guidelines for reporting searches, study selection, validity assessment, data abstraction, study characteristics, and data synthesis. So now, in five steps, I've reported to you the simple way you do a meta-analysis. Now let me give you examples and show you how those different techniques, such as meta-regression, the I-squared, uh, publication bias, were actually used to try to bring them to have real meaning for you. I'm going to discuss meta-analysis of clinical trials of sepsis. But first, let me explain to you how you treat sepsis. Sepsis is an infection, a bacterial infection in the body that has gone systemic. And the treatment is based on early recognition that you have symptoms of sepsis, a syndrome. You give the right antibiotics right away. You give rapid fluid resuscitation. 
You have the judicious use of agents to bring the blood pressure back up. They're called vasopressors. And you promptly address removal of the nidus of infection. Now, let me show you that you don't always need a meta-analysis. And this is one of the mainstays of therapy. It's antibiotics. And this is an analysis that was done of the benefits of starting appropriate antibiotic therapy. Throughout this talk, from here on in, I'm going to be describing the odds ratio of survival. The odds ratio of survival is the probability of surviving in one group, usually the treatment group, over the probability of surviving in another group, usually the control. The odds ratios here are the blue dot, okay? The blue line is the 95% confidence interval. This is a classic Christmas tree. This is the no effect line. If the odds ratios lie here, you're 10 times more likely to uh, survive, 100 times more likely, 1,000 times if it's the odds ratio of survival, and here you're less likely to survive. These are the various studies that were done from 1962 to 2003. If the confidence interval doesn't touch the no effect line, it's significantly beneficial. And you can see here, you don't need to do a meta-analysis to combine these studies. It's obvious, that, and it makes physiologic sense. Starting appropriate antibiotics versus the antibiotics that were proven to be inappropriate by cultures, patients did much better, they survived more. And in the same light, again showing antibiotics work, starting antibiotics early versus late, you can see all studies show basically the same thing. So I told you that asking the question is critically important. And the question we asked for the first meta-analysis I'm gonna show you is, there were studies of agents to inhibit inflammation in the 1980s and 1990s in septic patients. And there were more than 30 or 40 clinical trials, and all these trials failed. And the biotech industry in Europe North America, South America, many, many companies went bankrupt from this. And nobody quite understood because in animal models, these anti-inflammatory agents, animal models of sepsis, they were markedly beneficial, but all the clinical trials failed. So the first question we asked is why? Now, this is why we think anti-inflammatory agents should be beneficial. This is the pathogenesis of septic shock that we believe is correct and we still believe it's correct today. You have a nidus of infection, pneumonia, a urinary tract. It overwhelms the host and pathogens and toxins are released. The host releases inflammatory mediators and these inflammatory mediators are to fight the infection, but it's an over-exaggerated response. And these inflammatory mediators then cause shock and injury and result in multi-organ failure and death. We still believe that this is the pathogenesis of septic shock. Why did they fail? Well, we looked at all the clinical trials of anti-inflammatory agents. And this is my first example of a meta-regression. What I have here is the number of patients enrolled in the study from zero to 2,000. This is the no effect line. Again, I'm plotting the odds ratio of survival, the probability of surviving if you got the anti-inflammatory agents over the probability of surviving in a septic population that didn't. And here is benefit, and here is arm, and I'm going to show you all the different trials of anti-inflammatory agents that were done in the 1970s and 1980s. And we've updated this, but I'm not showing you that data now, but it still holds true. Here are the studies of anti-TNF antibodies. This study had 2,000 patients, this study had 1,000, and you can see the large trials all show this same small beneficial trend. It's not significant because the 95% confidence interval crosses the no effect line, and smaller studies were more variable. Now I'm gonna show you the next anti-inflammatory agent by turning these blue and showing you the next one white again. And the next one was soluble TNF receptors, and it had the same pattern. The next one was IL-1 receptor antagonism, antagonists, another anti-inflammatory agent, the same pattern. The next was platelet activating factor receptor antagonists, the same pattern. The next was antiprostaglandins, the same pattern. And finally, antibradykinins, 
And this is not random data, and again, you don't need to do an analysis. The largest 11 trials all showed the same beneficial trend, and the smaller trials were more variable. And this is a highly statistically significant result. And what it says is, is that the anti-inflammatory agents were beneficial, but we expected an eight to 10% effect, and the real effect was only two to 3%. And you'd need a trial of six to 8,000 patients in order to show this beneficial effect in a randomized trial, which still today no one has done. Now, we knew that there was a small treatment effect, and we asked, well, what is common to all these clinical trials that they, all these anti-inflammatory agents produce the same treatment effect. These are different anti-inflammatory agents. And we looked at many things, and we only found one that really was very similar across all these trials. And that was the control mortality rate. And my statistician, who was doing clinical trials for many, many years and analyzed them, said this is highly unusual. These are all the clinical trials. They're trials of IL-1A. These are just the controls and shows their mortality. And all of them had a mortality of about 30%. So we knew two things. We knew that there was a very small treatment effect and all the studies were done about at the same severity of illness, a 30% mortality. So then there's about 21 studies here. We asked, well, let us look at the animal studies and see if they were done at the same control mortality. Is there a difference? And so in these 21 studies, there were 95 animal studies referenced. So we took the 95 animal studies, and the next slide, I'm gonna show you a meta-analysis we did of that. Now this is a new meta-regression. I've turned the Christmas tree that I've been describing on its side. This is benefit. This is harm. Benefit. And what you find is, the first thing you find is, is that I'm plotting it versus the control mortality. A control mortality of one is a 50% mortality. I have to use the control odds of dying so I don't limit the ranges. It's a statistical issue. But one means a 50% mortality. This is 100% mortality and this is zero. The first thing you note is, is that almost all the studies were done above a 50% mortality and there were only two studies done at a low control mortality. When I showed this at the, comp at the place where the companies did the studies, they said, oh yeah, we know that. Anytime we did the study at a below a 50% mortality, we found no effect or harm, so we just threw the data out. That partially explains why all the studies that were done showed benefit, except these two. And also explains that even with all these studies done in this beneficial range, there's a highly statistically significant result that at higher control mortality rates in these animal models, anti-inflammatory agents were beneficial. But as the control mortality rate decreased, they actually became harmful or had no effect. So the next question I ask, well, what if we plot the animal data and the human data on the same graph? Now will they look like they belong together and they have the same findings? Yes. The human studies were done at much lower control mortality rates. Well, the next question we asked is, can we show this prospectively? This is a retrospective analysis that we look back. Somebody says, well, if you ask the question ahead of time, which is statistically more valid, the p-value, the probability value, can you reproduce this? So we began doing studies where we altered the dose of bacteria or toxin in the animal. A large dose of bacteria will cause a high mortality and a low will cause a low mortality. And this is what we found. Again, this is a meta-regression. Here is benefit, here is harm, and here are the control arts of dying, the control mortality rate, which is what we're regressing this data. And here's a 50% mortality. And you can see below a 50% mortality, these anti-inflammatory agents look terrible. Above a 50% mortality, they look like they are great treatment. And what we found was the same thing. When you have a severely lethal infection, anti-inflammatory agents are beneficial. But as the level of severity of the infection goes down and the inflammatory response is working well and you inhibit it, you get an increase in mortality, not a decrease. And 
we asked, does the, uh, we use all different types of challenges, and if we did it in a different species, dogs, we found the same result, and the patients fit exactly where you'd expect them to fit in this analysis. So, in summary, doing a meta-analysis, we found that the treatment effects were small. Doing meta-regression, we found that the efficacy was dependent on risk. The meta-regression, based on control mortality, explained to us why there were different treatment effects, why there was one effect in animals and another effect in humans. They're beneficial at high risks, but they're ineffective or harmful at low risk. So let me talk about another therapy, corticosteroids in sepsis. And again, on this set of studies, I'm gonna to try to explain to you again what a meta-regression is, and I'm also gonna to try to explain to you what the I squared, and I'm gonna to try to go over in detail what a funnel plot is. Steroids have been investigated since the 1960s. By the early 1990s, they were shown to be ineffective or possibly harmful. There was renewed interest in new trials over the last decade, mostly in Europe. Again, now I'm showing you the same Christmas tree plot, no effect, and now I'm regressing this against the year the study was published, because that's the informative data, and again, we're looking at the odds ratio of survival, benefit of steroids, harm of steroids. And what you find here is the studies that were done from 1963 to 1988 mostly show harm or no effect except this one study. So let's look at the I squared. The I squared is 70%. It's above 20%. You, every time you look at a meta-analysis, that's the first thing you should look at. These studies should not be combined. Now you can't just remove a study because of statistical reasons. You also have to have methodological. But let's see what happens if we do remove this study. The I squared goes to zero. The methodologic reason that this study is different is it was done by one surgeon in Chicago over 10 years by himself, and it had selection bias that the other studies didn't have. And if you look at the other studies, there's a highly statistically significant result, but it's harmful. So at, these studies all represented short courses of high-dose corticosteroids, 24,000 milligrams given over 48 hours, and they worsened survival. What about the later studies, mostly of them, most of them that were done in Europe? Well, the studies done a decade later, from 1998 to 2008, actually showed benefit. Stress dose corticosteroids at much lower doses tapered over six days were associated with improved survival. But what you should be saying is, well, show me the I squared. Can you combine all those studies? Do they make sense? Well, the I squared is 25%. If it's above 20%, you're worried. And one trial called the corticus looks like it has a different effect. Let's see what happens if we remove it. What happens to the I squared? it goes to zero. But what you find is, is no matter if you remove it or don't remove it is benefit. But now I'm gonna ask you a very different question. Which is correct? The corticus or the, all the other studies? Well, let's look at the data and using meta-regression and using funnel plots, try to analyze the variability because that's where you learn things, is by looking at the variability and why the studies differ. Well, why is corticus different from the 11 other trials of low-dose steroids? Here are the 11 other studies plotted, as I've shown you multiple times, versus the control odds. And what you find is you find the same relationship. That is, steroids, which have anti-inflammatory effects, are just like the other anti-inflammatory agents, but what you find is, is the corticus was done at a low control mortality rate, so as you expect, it had a low treatment effect. Let's look at another part of the steroid treatment. Let's look at the effect of steroids on, on uh, well first let's do a funnel plot to try to understand this data. So now we're gonna see if all these studies are part of a random sample or there's some bias. And we're gonna, we know that the corticus study is different than the other studies, and we know that it had a low control mortality rate, but it was a large randomized trial. So the results are very solid. It was multi-center, 
and it was very consistent data. So let's do a funnel plot of all these studies. This is a funnel plot. Here is the no effect line, here is benefit, here is harm, and this really just tells you the size of the study. And here's the treatment effect. What we have plotted here is the odds ratio, log odds ratio of death that is decreased with low dose steroids. Normally you'd expect that the studies would fall on both sides of these in a random sample around this treatment effect if it was normally distributed, which is what you expect about a treatment effect. Well, you find that they're not normally distributed. First thing you see is all the studies, except two, are very small. This, this should lead you to wonder, why are all the small studies skewed over here? If you, destroy, if you draw a line which represents the normal distribution that you'd expect, or where you'd expect the studies to lie, which is what the funnel plot is, which is what this red line is, you see that multiple studies are outside the funnel plot, and they're all small studies, and they show benefit. And if this was correct result, what you'd find is that all the studies would be within this funnel, and they'd be normally distributed around this blue line. That is, half would be here, and half would be here. This is publication bias, and what it suggests is, is that there were a lot of small studies done, and only the ones that showed benefit were published, because nobody would publish a small study that did not show benefit. It's the drawer problem uh, that is described. Things are left in the drawer because no one will publish them. Well, one more effect in these studies was shock. And you can see here the result is very different. All the studies showed the exact same thing, including corticus. They all reverse shock. And the I squared is zero. So this is an effect that you believe. It's consistent over many studies. So corticosteroids effects during sepsis depend on dose and severity of illness. High dose steroids increase mortality. Low dose corticosteroids improve survival in severely ill patients. Low dose steroids decrease pressure requirements and enhance shock. But at present, the beneficial effects of low dose steroids are based on small trials. Those small studies were on average only 40 patients. And they're confounded by publication bias. So that data is not interpretable. The largest study, the one that was the outlier, is actually the correct study. It showed that in a low-risk population, corticosteroids are not beneficial. But we still don't know, even despite studies over 50 years, what is the beneficial effect in high-risk patients. And this has to be still determined. So until new data are available, the decision to administer low-dose steroids for septic shock should be individualized. I hope these studies in this section have helped you understand the I-squared, have understand meta-regression again, and given you an idea of what the funnel plot does and why there's the issue of publication bias is important. Let me go now to the last topic where I'm going to show you what a sensitivity analysis is. It's intensive insulin therapy in patients with sepsis. How much risk and how much benefit? There was a paper published in 2001 in the New England Journal of Medicine that said keeping sugars very, very low in critically ill patients was beneficial. And based on a single center, unblinded study, everyone around the world changed practice. JACO recommended this treatment, which is a hospital organization in the United States, the American College of Endocrinology, volunteer hospitals, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Surviving Sepsis Campaign, and I traveled through South America giving talks and people were immediately also in many countries adapting this based on a single center, unblinded study done in Brazil, not in Brazil, done in Brussels by an anesthesiologist. So what did they study in this single center study that showed tight glucose that is, if you compare people being maintained 180 to 200 conventional versus 80 to 110, what were they studying? Well, they were almost all studying cardiac surgery patients, 63% of both arms. What they were studying is 50 to 60-year-old 
men with coronary disease that were having coronary bypass cabbages that were spending three days in the hospital. That was the majority of the population they were studying. And what was, where was the big treatment effect? Well, this shows the number of deaths in the conventional intensive, and there's a difference of 28, and most of them come from the cardiac surgery patients, 15. The thing you have to understand about the study was, single center unblinded, just like the steroid study by the surgeon I discussed with you that took a decade for people to find out that that result was wrong, and they had a relatively high mortality in this study compared to other studies done around the world. It was 5.1%. To give you an example, in the state of Massachusetts in the United States, there are 11 cardiac intensive care units. And if you reported a mortality above 3% in any one of those units, it would be shut down. This is double the mortality rate for cardiac intensive care units. And the other thing they did was, Immediately postoperatively, they gave two to three liters of D10 or D20. They took a patient that's going to go home in three days. When he came out of the intensive care unit, gave him high glucose loads. This is a patient who has fresh lines throughout his body. Fresh external lines and high glucose loads was not the routine care for cardiac surgery patients and gives you a high risk of infection and serious infection and death. So now let's do a meta-analysis, because since 2001, multiple other studies were done. And here is the study in 2001, and multiple people tried to reproduce this result, and you can see for the most part, all of the studies subsequent, here's the first study that doesn't cross the no effect line, all cross the no effect line. 27 trials of I like glucose, appropriately you ask me, what is the I squared? Can we combine all these studies? It's 17%, it's below 20%. And what we found is, is there's no effect. Now, what you wanna do is a sensitivity analysis. You wanna look at different factors to make sure that this result isn't being generated by one or two different types of studies, that it's a consistent effect. So let's do a sensitivity analysis and look at different factors and see if the result is similar to the overall result. Here's our sensitivity analysis. In with patients with just glucose less than 110, you found the same result, 14 trials. Didn't matter if you use less type control, this treatment still was not beneficial. If you just looked at surgical intensive care units, the effect was the same, no benefit. If you looked at just medical, no benefit. If you looked at med surge, still no benefit. So that's what a sensitivity analysis, which you should do in all meta-analysis to see the consistency of the findings. The I squared gave you an idea that the effects would be consistent. This is confirmatory. But let's look at if the data shows a reason there's no benefit or there's potentially harm. And let's look at now hypoglycemia. If you had sugars less than 110 you, you, as your goal, you had hypoglycemia. And if you had sugars that you aimed at for less than 150, you had hypoglycemia, surgical, medical, medical surgical. And again, the I squared is zero and you very much believe this result, it's consistent. And the big risk of this treatment of tight glucose control was, high glu was hypoglycemia. And we're talking about serious hypoglycemia. There's a seven, eight-fold increased risk of hypoglycemia, sugars less than 40, independent of the target glucose of where you were in terms of a medical or surgical or combined intensive care unit. Well, these studies that I showed you were all small or relatively small, and the effect sizes here are relatively small. So somebody asked, well, if I did a large trial, could I actually determine if there's no effect or there's a small benefit or a small harm. And they did this in Australia. They decided to do a study of a large number of patients of intensive versus conventional control in critically ill patients. But now they really enrolled critically ill patients of all varieties. They enrolled 6,000 patients, surgical, were 37%, Apache scores, which is a measure of illness, were very high, and they had severe sepsis, and all of them were mechanically ventilated. So it was a large group of critically ill patients. And what they found was is that 
intensive insulin therapy increased mortality. It's a small percentage from 24 to 27 percent and there was a significant increase in hypoglycemia. So in 6,000 critically ill patients, tight glucose control was associated with hypoglycemia and increased mortality. On the basis of the results, we do not recommend the use of lower targets in critically ill patients. So I've been doing research in sepsis for 30 years, and there's lots of therapies, not all that I've discussed today, where there was benefit in at least one trial and people adopted them. And a large number of them were single center, unblinded studies. And my last point to, be, to you is gonna be is, what is the critical factor in research? What is the critical factor in science? What went wrong with these anti-inflammatory agents, steroids, tight glucose control? Where did we make our air? The basis of science. Well, these were studies of anti-endotoxin. In red, I'm showing you the trials where they showed benefit. J5 antiserum was a, uh, they gave endotoxin subcutaneously to firemen and they developed an antiserum. And the original trial was published in the New England Journal and showed benefit. Subsequent trials couldn't reproduce this result shown in blue, and this is the overall effect of the subsequent trials. Monoclonal antibodies then were developed. There was a trial in New England Journal showed benefit. Subsequent trials couldn't reproduce this effect. High dose steroids. We discussed that already. Initial trials showed benefit. Subsequent trials couldn't produce this effect and actually showed harm. IL-1-RA, the same thing. Initial trials showed benefit, couldn't be reproduced. Activated protein C, another therapy anti with anti-inflammatory effects. Initial trials showed benefit, subsequent trials couldn't produce this effect. This was also published in the New England Journal, as was this treatment published in the New England Journal and showed benefit. And subsequent trials couldn't reproduce it. There's a highly statistically significant shift from the beneficial trial to the last trial that was done. P-value 003, showing initial trials, showed benefit that in subsequent trials couldn't be reproduced. But what I think went, went wrong, and one has to understand in all of science, is that people thought that randomization had magic. That if you randomized, there was something about it, and particularly if it was published in the New England Journal, that it had to be correct. And these were single center unblinded studies, a large portion of them. And many of these studies that were the initial ones were, had inconsistent results. And what is the real sine qua non of science, the really important factor, is reproducibility. The randomized control just minimizes bias, but it doesn't eliminate the need for reproducibility, which is the important factor, the indispensable factor in scientific evidence and is what we try to use in meta-analyses to show if we should describe an overall effect or if we should look for variability. So I hope today in this talk, I've presented to you what a meta-analysis is, what meta-regression is, what the I-squared means, what funnel plots do, and how you use these techniques to understand data and publish results. Thank you.